I've heard a lot of different benefits of playing video games. Better hand-eye coordination, improved problem-solving skills, who knows, you might even learn some history. But better investigative skills with regards to secret content? No one talks about that. Almost ironic in a way. All this talk of myths and legends makes you feel like an adventurer, doesn't it? Although less discovering ancient cities with oodles of treasure and more like, hey, this video game has a hidden feature that isn't immediately obvious. Small steps, small steps. Naturally, if enough people end up playing the same game, rumours will start circulating that there's something more than meets the eye about it. The creativity behind these rumours can get pretty crazy, occasionally out of hand, but goddamn if it isn't entertaining to hear about. Though my favourite types of urban legends are the ones that never come true. This idea that, for a while at least, this fabrication was believed to be genuine. A rumour started and maintained by people who really wanted this game to be this particular thing. Not sure if you can really get on anyone's back for it, unless of course the urban legend is more on the creepy side of things. Then you're just trying to inject horror into a scenario that doesn't really need it. Besides, I can talk about those another day. Maybe when I need that sweet YouTube money a bit more. Always good to have a contingency plan. I don't really want to get too caught up in the vast and mostly stupid world of creepypastas, mostly because only a fool would find spaghetti terrifying, but also because I've never read one that I thought could be real. Even Ben Drowned, one of the most famous and engaging video game creepypastas out there, never really grabbed me as anything that I should be taking too much like fact. It might just be me, but I like my urban legends more when I don't know if they're true or not. Maybe with hindsight we can say that Hero Brian from Minecraft wasn't all that convincing, but at the time, Goddamn spooky shit. In the early stages of playing Minecraft, I wanted to discover everything for myself and give it a chance in single player. Every YouTube video at that stage was about the multiplayer, so I really wanted to concentrate on the world itself and how you'd go about exploring it. Apparently, you were never alone. Hidden in the darkness of every Minecraft server, regardless whether you're playing with other people or not, lives a terrifying creature known as Herobrine or Herobrine, or, you know, it actually doesn't matter, he doesn't exist anyway. But for a while there, oh man, it was scary stuff. Supposedly Herobrine lurks around your Minecraft server, making slight changes to the landscape, things like making pyramids in the middle of oceans and taking leaves off of the trees. In other words, the kind of tactics that a human player would use to unnerve someone else. Apparently he's a ghost of some kind, which at least explains his soulless eyes and his ability to disappear without a trace, but doesn't explain why no enemy within Minecraft is coded to behave like he does. But hey, at least the Minecraft community had something to write disturbing stories about. Then again, I've read fanfics involving creepers, so maybe a bit unnecessary. Mental scarring however you shake it. The 90s were a strange time. Video games were going through a big transitional period where they were screwing around with three dimensions and occasionally voice acting, and suddenly we were having complex narratives woven into a medium that had been, for a long time, quite a basic endeavour. Games like Tomb Raider might look blocky as all hell nowadays, but back in the day it was exciting shit. Especially if you are in need of the kind of comfort that someone like Lara Croft provides. Prepubescent males the world over were a huge fan of many different aspects of Lara Croft's character. Not just limited to her acrobatics and her determination in the face of great danger, but also some of her other assets. As one of the first 3D rendered heroines in gaming, everyone with a penis naturally wanted to see what she looked like without clothes on. With the rumour being that such a fantasy was possible due to a code existing in the game that could do just that. Your brain might tell you that this would be impossible since it's rated teen, but once you start listening to your penis, you just can't stop. It was optimistic, but alas no such code exists in Tomb Raider. You can input other codes that can give you all the weapons in the game or skip levels, but nothing that actually matters. Indeed, if you're really that desperate, you can find patches online that remove Lara Croft's clothes, or if you're really desperate, it's 20 years later and the internet is so saturated with pornography that I'm surprised any of you have the concentration to watch this video. It's appreciated, always has been. The pursuit of Lara Croft being naked got to such a point and picked up so much pace that it caught the attention of the developers of Tomb Raider, the people who made Lara Croft into this sex symbol. And so at the end of the second game she's about to hop into the shower and then shotgun blasts straight into the camera. They fucking knew about it. Personally I would have passed anyway, seen enough triangle tits in Zelda games. Playing 
playing a video game within the comfort of your own home and the power of the internet in the 21st century means that you can experience as much of said game as you like. You can take it at face value, or you can search around on the internet for the kind of hidden content that would have taken years to find without it. Trying to find all the secrets in an arcade game not only requires the kind of dedication to constant playing that arguably won't have the kind of payoff that the effort deserves, but also costs quite a lot of money. Which is where the idea of urban legends specific to jumping through ridiculous hoops in arcade games starts to sound like an impossible goal. Ten consecutive rounds against M. Bison with neither taking damage resulting in a bunch of draws? Fuck off with that. Shenlong in Street Fighter 2 is as close to an accidental urban legend as you're gonna get. One of Ryu's quotes when he defeats an opponent lets them know that they don't stand a chance against him unless they can overcome his rising dragon punch. Translate this from Japanese to Chinese and you end up with some bullshit about Shen Long, a character who isn't actually in the game in any capacity but the rumor mill started churning and all of a sudden he's actually Ken and Ryu's master who you can only fight if you tick off this ridiculous checklist and Electronic Gaming Monthly got involved twice with April Fool's jokes. In the end, no dice. You can try and try until you're blue in the face, but no amount of black magic or sacrificing small animals will get Shen Long on your screen. Pray that you were trying to find him on the SNES version. The idea of pumping so much money into an arcade machine in a fruitless attempt to find a hoax. Not appealing. Work on better translators for next time. I don't mention it as often as I'd like, but whenever there's a chance to talk about Pokemon, there's usually quite a lot of examples of that particular topic. A few weeks ago it was post-games, and now it's urban legends. For one reason or another, there are so many urban legends surrounding Pokemon. Do you need to make it more exciting? Why would you feel the need to make it creepy? We all know how Lavender Town made Japanese kids vomit out of their eyeballs and that every bootleg Pokemon game hates you and wants your soul, but I think only one urban legend has transcended these parlor games and become something more. A lot of urban legends come about from wanting a game to be something that it's not, hence the nude code in Tomb Raider. And what's the one thing you couldn't do in the first generation of Pokemon? Catch them all, funnily enough. I get that some Pokemon are rarer than others, have a higher value, more needs to be done if you want to make them yours, etc, etc. But not putting them in the game in any capacity is kind of a dick move. I've never seen the reason behind event Pokemon. It's kind of like physical DLC that you've got to go some way out of your way to pick up. And they've been doing this for years! There might have been 151 Pokemon to catch in red, blue, yellow, green... But even linking two games together to pick up version exclusives only left you with 150. Mew was nowhere to be seen, which is a shame because he's so adorable, you'd, you'd want to have one. But hang on a sec, apparently he's under this truck in Vermilion City! You just gotta, uh, get here by using Surf, which you're not supposed to know at this point, and I think use Strength on it? No, actually, you need to beat the Elite 400 times, train up a level 92 Machamp, don't go over 92, then you need to find the keys to the truck in the game corner, and only then can you find Mew in or under the truck, maybe driving it, I'm not sure. It's stupid, not a chance, but I remember trying it. Spread fast this rumour, mostly because players really wanted to believe that Mew was somewhere in this game. Has anyone tried looking under a truck in Pokemon Go yet? Probably the first thing that players tried. I like my urban legends with just a small dose of unnerving without delving into full-blown creepypasta. I guess because I like my horror stories to be at least a bit believable. There's a time and place for a video game to be possessed by some really pissed off dead kid, but I'm not sure I can suspend my disbelief that far. An arcade machine that screws around with a user with the findings being tracked by the government. Oh yeah, now we're talking. There are certain circles who will state that Polybius, Polybius, I, I've, I've made this joke already, wasn't fun back then either. Some people will state that Polybius can't be an urban legend because it's actually true. The US government decided to take advantage of an audience who will play whatever is put in front of them to run some weird tests and see what happens. The stories go that men in black suits were seen taking reels of paper out of the back of the arcade cabinet with players experiencing numerous health problems such as amnesia, depression, nightmares, and worst of all, a refusal to play any more video games. This black featureless arcade machine produced by a company known as Sinnerschlossen, German for sense delete or sensory deprivation, or something, caused quite a stir despite its limited release in a few suburbs in Portland, Oregon. What's the game like then? Dunno, you would have thought that'd be common knowledge by now. 
The story of Polybius is one that starts to lose its foundations the more you hear about it. It's believed that the idea behind the urban legend came from players suffering from motion sickness after playing an early version of Tempest, while others picked up stomach aches for playing too much Asteroid. Like 28 consecutive hours of Asteroid! 28 consecutive hours of anything would fucking ruin you! Apparently the FBI investigated a few arcades in the area because the owners were suspected of using them for gambling, but other than that, no concrete records of any arcade machine even come close to this. It's a story that isn't helped by the first mention of it coming in 1998. Don't know about you, but I wouldn't keep something like this quiet for 17 years. It'd make a great story to tell, letting strangers know that the government tried to brainwash you by giving you a video game to play. You'll be the most interesting person in the room. This is Mario Luigi, and while I do find the story of Polybius to be a bunch of shit, I still find the idea of governmental surveillance on this kind of thing kind of interesting. Not good by any means, but I think the reason behind it would be worth a listen. Effectively, why video games? Who knows, they could be monitoring you right now. Having this video in your search history probably implies something. Mostly intelligence, I think. Got a topic that you'd like me to discuss in a countdown? Leave a suggestion in a comment below and head over to my Twitter where I'll be holding a vote to decide the subject of the next countdown based off the best of your submissions. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that. It is 4 in the morning, I think roughly single digit Celsius outside, but that's okay because it's October and I'm planning for November which for me will be a month all about Pokemon. Kinda hard working on two things at once, but you just need to put in that small bit of effort every day. It tends to make a difference in the long run. Anyway, if you like this video and want to support me a bit more directly, and I guess hear more about this month of Pokemon, still working on a name, then head on over to my Patreon where you'll probably find something there which is kinda cool. If there isn't, tell me in the morning, I think I can see the sun rising off in the distance. That's a race I'm probably not gonna win.